And now I'd like to turn to uh, our featured modeler for this evening, Corinne Haskell. And this is uh, the third time Corinne's been on the show. And Corinne, I really do uh, appreciate you coming back. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing what you've been working on lately and hearing about the, uh, the production situation over in your part of the world. So welcome. Tonight, I want to talk about two things, really. Um, one, uh, initially, a little bit about production. I live in Taiwan before the virus. I used to commute to China a lot. Um, ever since that happened, I've basically just been in Taiwan the whole time. Um, but, oh, sorry. Uh, um, and then in the second part, I'll talk a little bit about my own model. Now, summed up in two sentences, the main gist of what is happening with production in China is it is still very much reduced in volume. Um, it's regionally affected. China is a huge country. Remember, China is bigger than the United States physically. So what's, but it's also more divided in some other ways, the regional differences economically, linguistically, whatever, um, are much bigger than most countries. And in the past, Guangdong next to Hong Kong was really where a lot of model production and toy production in general was done. Um, it started from the late 1970s, Hong Kong factories moving across into Guangdong for cheaper labor. But Guangdong became the richest province in China. And because of that, they were reliant on getting cheap workers from other provinces in China. When the virus became a big issue, um, workers were going home for Lunar New Year, didn't want to come back because the government implemented essentially quarantining for travel between provinces in China without Workers, it's hard to make things. Um, now, there is some production in other, other parts of the country, notably Shandong for brass, Anhui for plastic, uh, and brass, uh, but more brass, and around Shanghai for a bit of plastic. They may have been affected less, but in recent times, we've also had power shortages. Um, and guys I know in China are producing, on average, maybe ballpark a quarter what they were producing before. Um, at the same time, we had uh, increased demand from people sitting at home in the West. Now, I know of one specific factory a very um, specific instance where they went from over 130 workers to under 30 at one point. At the same time, power cuts and then restrictions on operating where they used to operate nine to nine, six days a week. Um, they were restricted by the government to finishing at 6 p.m. Um, then also we've had other supply chain issues, um, collapse, not only in shipping, but part because of shipping. And also say you're producing something and you've been working for a long time with a handful of suppliers. It's quite normal. Say you buy paint or ink from one company company, you'll get used to their colors. If suddenly they're not supplying you because they've gone bankrupt because their other customers have fallen apart, then you're going to have to find a new supplier. That can sometimes take time and time just to get used to working with them. Maybe their colors are a little different. You need to adjust for that. So we really had this almost insane level of perfect storm about um, problems and combined with increased demand. Now, 
I'll talk a little bit about how mass-produced models are made. I realize some of you may have some sense of this, um, but just having an, a background understanding also will help explain the problems. Any plastic or die-cast model, first step, design. Now, okay, I, I realize that's the first step on anything. Um, these days, really three programs to us matter. AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Unigraphics, Graphics, sometimes called UG. Um, we, we start by getting dimensions, drawing, photos of the real thing. To that extent, it's always easiest when we make a model of a train, we can actually access the real one. Although if it's one that's been in service for a long time, often you find a lot of variations. Uh, the picture I've got up on the screen now is of a Taiwan model we're making um, in a scale that most of you have probably never heard of called HOJ. It's essentially much like British double O. Taiwan uses three foot six, very much Japanese influence. Taiwan's a former Japanese colony. Um, Karen? Yes? Uh, did you say you had an image up? Yeah. Well, it's a, a slide. Okay, you're not sharing. Oh, okay. Um, ah. Um, sorry, two seconds. Um, uh, damn. Damn. Um, sorry. Green share button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Irene, if that button isn't showing and you're on a Windows machine, hit Alt key. Oh, uh, uh. Okay, two seconds. Um. Okay, uh, um, now can we see it? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll just skip through. Okay, what I've got here um, on the left is a model, uh, drawings of model we're making in HOJ, um, which is HO gauge, but it's a slightly larger scale, something like double O in the UK, which partly but not correctly accounts for the difference in scale uh, um, and gauge. Uh, that if you put it next to most HO scale models on HO gauge track, it'll, it'll look about the same size. But if you were to put a real Taiwan or Japanese train next to an American standard gauge train, it would look quite small. So when we're making a model, first thing, get drawings, get dimensions, get pictures. Um, we'll create a 3D drawing. A really complex 3D drawing takes a lot of work, and that's also used to make uh, tooling drawings. Um, once the, the 3D drawing of the model is made. Now, mold tooling is a bizarre dark art sometimes. You have all sorts of consideration about uh, contraction of different types of plastic. Sometimes will use different plastics for different reason. Like the most common plastic would be ABS, um, which is cheap and fairly hard, but say we'll use PS for clear plastic windows or POM, PP, something like that um, for something that needs a little bit of flexibility, like say a brake hose. Um, uh, nylon is usually used for gears, it's, it's more expensive but it's fairly strong. Um, anyway, obviously, before we do the, the mold cutting, we try and check the drawings as much as possible. Um, 
a lot of people now think about 3D printing. In mass production, I, I believe it has its place in models and it will continue to grow a little bit, but to me, it is not the be all and end all. We use it just for creating samples that we can look at, that we can paint, that we can check out coupler heights in the real world of running. Um, the 3D programs are amazing. You can do things like uh, have gears turn. That said, um, there's no substitute for being able to put it on a layout, just see how it looks. But the injection molds are incredibly uh, tight on tolerances. So for things like paint masks and that, we use the, the molded piece, not something that's been 3D printed. But like I said, it, it can certainly, for something that has a, a minor degree of tolerance about differences, um, like a couple of height, yes, we'll use them. Um, one of the other reasons I'm not as big a believer in 3D printing as everyone else is, people tend to think of a model as being a plastic model or a die cast model, something like that. In reality, if you look at most models, you'll probably find at least half a dozen different materials. Now, sometimes they'll just be different types of plastic, but then maybe you'll have metal wheels. Um, the couplers, you could have brass for one part, steel for another part. Um, you'll have wires that have insulation. You, you might have etch grills. You're not going to be able to 3D print all of those things. Um, and even if you could, would you have the arbor press or the jigs to put them together um, and decorate them? Now, at the moment, model production is still quite labor intensive as a rule of thumb. I realize that people are always looking for ways to move ahead. I've seen a couple of rare instances. Uh, I recently saw a video Pico had up of where they had robots making track, which is just, wow. Um, but that said, it is the exception, not the rule. Um, and that's really how a lot of production was moved to China in the 1980s. Labor was cheap at the time. But that's become a lot less true over time. It's basically moved into a middle income country. Um, now, sorry, I'm just going to move that for two seconds. This picture I've brought up now with the orange engine with blue and white stripes, I'd like to use as an example of why we would produce something in multiple pieces, decorate it and then put it together. You can see these stripes wrap around. That's for us the most difficult thing with decoration on this model is that the stripes have to line up. But say the cab, we would not be able to print. Um, you can see the hood and the, the cab, the stripes basically join up. A printing pad won't get right in there where they join um, and unless it's a separate piece so it's it's got a nice flat area with nothing next to it, um, it then it's easy so we would make the hoods and the cab separately put them together that allows for accurate decoration obviously the positioning has to be very good so that that white line lines up now for big areas the usual thing is paint masks. Um, sometimes on very flat things, people will use a, a silk screen, but a rule of thumb is paint masks um, for plastic or die cast models at least. Uh, it doesn't work for brass because they tend to have a little bit of variation on each model that we don't get with plastic. Um, but the very fine white lines, it's usually something called tempo printing, sometimes called pad printing. Uh, they are not decals. As soon as I hear someone say decals, no, I know that they don't really understand it. Um, decals are a lot more scratchable and tempo printing is very efficient if you're doing a lot. It's not very good for one. It takes a lot of time to line things up. 
Um, that said, we need a whole lot of other parts. And to that end, operating in an area where we have a cluster of suppliers is very important. We're lucky in Taiwan, we have a, a, such a cluster due to other industries, even though there are not a lot of model producers in Taiwan. There are actually a couple of others that don't do trains and one other of significance that does trains. Um, but being able to get things like PCBs, ink, paint, plastic pellets, um, any of that in a hurry. So say you underestimate the amount you need, you could, we can get more plastic, basically same day or next day. Um, if I was in, I don't know, rural Australia or America, we'd probably have to wait a few days. Um, now, something that in real terms actually fell a lot in cost was mold production. It's still very expensive. Um, the reason it fell was mechanization. I've just got um, a video here. You can see running briefly the water. Um, it's all being, it's all machinery that is operating um, often 24 seven. I'll leave it running overnight in many cases. So it's the machine doing the work, but the very expensive machines. Uh, once upon a time, you had very skilled laborers cutting the dyes, tools, whatever you like to call them. Um, that said, in recent times, just the cost of materials rising, uh, it's starting to go up again. Um, but relative to inflation, it's, it's still a lot cheaper than it was. Now, in the next picture, I've got a, a couple of photographs of tools, molds, um, pulled apart. The one, the photograph on the bottom left, you can see those round uh, big bits sticking out. Not the biggest bit at the bottom, but sort of a bit more towards the middle. Those are so slides uh, can go in and out at an angle. Um, when you have what basically say I wanted to make um, uh, things with holes on different sides. If you were to just have two pieces coming together, you would not be able to make holes on both sides. So what we do then is have something called a slide coming from a different direction. Um, you also have ejector pins. Whenever you see those round dots on plastic, sometimes small, sometimes big, that's the ejector pin. That's what pushes the plastic out of the mold so it doesn't get stuck in there. Now, they usually look a lot like what is in the photograph on the right. Ironically, in this case, these are not actually ejector pins. They're so that a hole can be made in, in a piece of plastic that would otherwise be solid and thus have the same effect as the slide. Um, the point of this is, is really to show that molds are a little bit like a piece of string in terms of how long, well, how complex, how big, um, how many bits. I've often been asked, how much does a mold cost? And it's like asking, well, how much does a car cost? Is it a beat up old Chevy or Toyota? Is it a new Ferrari? Um, the same for molds. So I'm aware of manufacturers that have run models to half a million shots, um, even on locomotives for some really big brands. Most of our molds will make them to last for 50,000 pieces minimum. Um, some things more, because there are certain items, like say a truck or bogey, depending on how you like to say it, you might use across a number of models, we might end up using more of. Um, now, when plastic is injected, it, it usually is fairly quick. Um, that said, the cycle time can vary for a piece. The one we've got um, running now on this video, it, it's track. 
and it takes about 33 seconds, if I remember correctly. Um, a negative aspect that most people don't realize is how much wastage there is. Um, there's actually more plastic injected on the sprue than on the track. That said, it can be thrown back in for reuse, recycled. But we basically give it to the factory as the to outsourcing injecting molding for us. Um, in Taiwan, we operate on a kind of, uh, it's, it's a basically a Jap Japanese drug production model, not model as in model trains, but a working model, um, where we have a number of suppliers we work with closely that are specialized. They may know nothing about trains, but they can know more about cutting a tool than we will ever understand. Or they have different injection facilities that um, we don't have. So in our case, okay, another example I've got um, here where you can see why is there wastage. Thankfully, plastic is cheap. Um, if you see the two trucks in the in brown on the top left, um, you can see those parts are quite obvious. Um, but if you look at the sprue, I think it actually weighs more than the trucks. Um, but we just throw that back in. They'll use it on other products where they're not as demanding as we are with models. Um, as modelers, we are demanding people. We want very fine details. We want little bits and we don't want them to break. Um, if you look at the other pictures here, we can see two other things. One is the one on the right, it's clear plastic. It's a different type of plastic, it's called PS. It has a different contraction rate to ABS and that has to be accounted for when the tools are being designed. Also, we have all these tiny parts. Um, when the tooling is being designed, we'll have a guy who understands tooling and he, he doesn't necessarily understand models at all, but we've just got the parts designed and he'll set it up for us that we um, get the mold balanced so that the plastic can flow well. And you don't get what's called a short shot where a, a, a piece isn't fully formed. Um, but you can see we've got numbers on all these parts. On the tooling drawing, we'll have all those part numbers in there. So when people are having production problems and they can't find, oh, where is that part? They can go back to the parts list. Um, this is perhaps an example of how we can do things in a way that workers can cross check and also understand, even if they don't understand all the design. Now, like I said before, we use a number of other um, types of materials. Here we've got a good example of why edges are used. The fans on the right, we would not be able to inject those. And even if you could, uh, I shouldn't say the fans, the grills over the fans. Uh, even if you could inject those, if you breathe within the vague vicinity of them, they probably break. Um, so we use an inch. Uh, the ones on the left are actually really tiny. They're for mounting thin wire. That wire is, I think, something like 0.7 of a millimeter um, in thickness. So that hole is maybe one millimeter. Um, so they're really small. They're, you know, they're what? Two twenty-fifths of an inch long, or something like that. Um, things like weights. Sometimes we can just stamp them. Sometimes they die cast. Um, die cast is great for weight. It's not quite so good for detail, um, unless you've got some very school tools, and even then you can have problems. Uh, things like wheels including even the, the plastic insert that stops them from getting a short circuit, they tend to be turned on an automated CNC lathe. Again, that's something else that's 
um, really come down in cost in real terms, but is jumping back up lately because of material costs. Now, here, I've got a photograph of an engine we're working on at the moment, someone else, but it's for Taiwan, so I don't think anyone else who sees it will be watching. Um, you can see the paint on the left. It's actually the same paint, but the top one is a single layer. The second photograph is a, a double layer. The, one on, the photograph on the right is the final base paint. Um, the customer was insistent we used the paint that was used on the real train, uh, which was a nightmare. It was too thick. Um, we had to thin it down and do it with multiple layers. This model has more than 400 parts. Um, really quite fiddly to put together. But that's why models can cost a lot of money um, and take a lot of time to develop. Now, okay, the next part. Um, painting, it's a simple process. Yes, I've seen automated paint lines. It's something I've got to set up and don't yet have. On the left, you'll see a copper mask. Again, it's, it's not the most sophisticated technology in the world, yet it's incredibly tight. They work to really fine tolerances, but it's been done with electrolysis. Um, you can see that hole in the middle. If we go back to the photograph I had just before, um, there's a, uh, an air conditioning unit behind the horn on the engine. There's a round hole on top that's a grill that's built into the plastic there. We're painting that black. That's how we do that with masking. Um, it could be printed, but because it's not flat being a grill, we'll paint it. Um, but the painting, we use quite a few of these masks. This is an exception to the rule that um, they are most often used for large pieces, not small pieces. Um, so we have big water wall paint booths. Um, I'm a reasonably tall guy, I'm about 6'2". That's a lot taller than me. Um, and it's really powerful. If someone's standing a couple of feet away smoking, I can't smell it. Uh, so sometimes if you see videos of model production and people aren't even wearing masks, that's why they can do that and not die. Um, I really want to automate mine though, so we have um, uh, we can just put the parts on it and the spray automatically go on when it goes in front. Now, okay, we've gone to artwork here. That's the model, albeit in a different livery that we were just looking at. Um, this is to show tempo printing um, plates where they uh, go and the different plates that are used. Um, the, sorry. Um, each of those little black lines at the bottom is something we're going to print on that model. So if you look at number five on the right, that's the windows, uh, the rubber rim on the, the windows. It's printed with, called tempo printing. It's drawn as a 2D drawing in this case, um, and then becomes an etching, um, which is used. Uh, so it's essentially a stamp um, that goes over the etching. You have a, a, a sort of blade that slides over with ink, um, and the ink is retained within it, where it's etched out. Then the stamp goes on, presses down, and that's how we print. Now, say the yellow wagon at the top, that's a difficult one because you've got those bracing bits sticking out. Now, if it's say like the, the 60 with the arrow in the middle, it's not so bad. It's not too close to the bracing. But if it's some of the other bits um, that go 
the, below the A, where it says 312. That's getting very close to the bracing. Um, it's very difficult to print because if the pad goes down and hits the bracing, it'll push back. You won't get a full print. Um, say the models below, bottom left, they're relatively simple to print, but they do have to be done twice uh, just to get the bits that you can see because you've got to flip the sides unless you've got a really heavily automated tempo printer, which costs a lot of money. Um, now, when we line it up, it's, we, we put tape over where we're going on a sample model, where we're going to print. And there's a lot of manual lining up. So to get the first one, right, just push, turning backwards and forwards. Um, you can see that guy at the top uh, where he's turning that wheel. That one's about uh, the mounting point, but the principle is the same that it's a lot of just manual turning. Now, the yellow wagon I just showed you, we, we had an unusually high rejection rate because that printing was so much against the bracing. We really should have ideally designed it with um, the bracing to be put on after the printing. That would have cost more in tooling. So what did we do? We offered them as weathered ones because they're an all wagon. I think they lasted about five minutes in regular service without getting messy. And no one really complained. Customers were happy to get weathered ones. We didn't charge more. Um, so we try and look for other solutions like that. Uh, okay, now I've got a few more images of uh, tempo printing. Um, I'm just going to run a video quickly. You can see um, they're adjusting for the, for, for the plate positioning in that. But you can see the plate in there with the edge. The one in the left top, the yellow bit at the top, it's a silicon pad. Um, the orange is where the ink is. And the blue with the orange on it is the hood of the model that's been printed. Um, so we have that mounting point, but below it's just, it's just a bit, very basic cheek that just push each piece on too hard. Um, but like I said, there's a, a lot of adjustment, but once it's right, you, you can print off a couple of thousand in a day by one person. Um, but on one model, you could have two pieces of printing, you could have 200, depending on the complexity. Um, but, okay, now we've got a close up of the etching plate and you can see the blade is pushed up back against the machine. The brown is the, the silicon that prints. We've got multiple numbers. So each time we use a different one, we have to adjust. But say we're making 150 of each number um for a wagon then we'll just have maybe five etching plates with different numbers we'll try and do as much as we can on on one hit but each each of those rows of writing is a different number set um each one will have to fiddle around to adjust to get the right position uh these days there are some other ways of doing this at the moment, they're expensive, but they're, they're falling in cost in real terms over time. You can see this, we're test printing here, which is why there's tape over the model. Once it's worked well, we'll rip that off. It's a, it's a type of printer. Um, this one comes from Japan. There are much cheaper ones from China, but they're just not as good. Um, it's essentially much like a home printer, or, albeit with a price tag that you'll barely believe. I think that one costs 40 something thousand US dollars. But it allows us to just print one of each model. So say we're doing a lot of different numbers, that's very good. Say we're doing a graduated uh, color variation, like the worst case scenario for tempo printing is a rainbow. On this, no big deal. Um, 
can't print silver or gold, but it can do pretty much everything else. It's a CMYK, like a, a, a multicolor process. Um, but the ink on these things only lasts so long. So they've got to keep being used. Um, otherwise, it ends up costing a fortune. But I think that's one of the things where things are headed. Now, because I'm in Taiwan and not China, Taiwan is not a poor country. Um, we're trying to automate as much as possible. You can see I'm running a video here of a machine that seems to have about 10 different names in English. I can't quite figure out what the name should be, but some kind of automated gluing machine. Um, you can call it a glue robot, whatever. We've got these, again, they're not cheap, they're, they're not outrageous. It's something vaguely akin to 3D printing. Um, but why would we have different ones? Sometimes we want to have a few different ones at once because we'll have different needles so that we can do very fine dots of glue or very big surfaces quickly. Um, if, you've, if you want to do, say, an interior to a chassis, on the inside of a car. You just want a big needle very quickly. Say you're doing handrail, those dots. Um, we, we want that to be very fine. Now, the machine, obviously you don't have someone there putting the glue on manually, that saves a lot of money. The less obvious, but not really that difficult to comprehend advantage of this machine is it reduces wastage. Uh, we don't end up throwing away pieces because so long as we put it in the jig correctly each time it gets the right spot every time um, we as humans will never be as good as a machine for that uh, but okay on the right i've got a picture of a fairly boring one of of just people putting together models that's that bit you can see they've got tweezers it's it's very like i said before, it's very labor intensive um, for those little parts, but that's how we do that. And at the moment, there is no real s solution to that. Um, but so long as we can automate some parts, we're ahead of the curve. Now you can see here, we've got headstocks, buffer beams, whatever you like to call them, on the left with brake hoses. The yellow lines have been sprayed with a mask, but those, um, brake hoses, we've, we've just hand painted individually the little silver heads and bottoms and the red bits and so on. Um, we're assembling things as basically as subsections, often different people doing different bits and then putting the final bits together. So on the left, we've got those headstocks, on the right, we've got some underframes. Um, that way we can get through things a bit faster. And also that the workers don't, when you build a model at home, you probably build one. You just do one bit at a time. Um, we'll do thousands at a time of one bit, but that means people get very up to speed. After you've done a, a few times, you'll get a bit faster. Um, that help, and it's also, they won't make as many mistakes. Um, Okay, you can see those bags of screws that may, again may seem like a very boring picture, but the point is there. They're bags of 10,000. If you buy 10, 20,000 of something, you'll get a different price to if you buy 10. Um, it, that and the inability to amateurize molds or setting up of printing is why very specialized models are always going to cost more than very mainstream models. So if you're making an F3, F7, Santa Fe and HO, you can probably do a very large number. Um, if you're making something in SN3 or something for a smaller country like Australia or Taiwan, um, you're probably not going to have big volume. Uh, this triggers a lot of the cost difference. Um, 
most of you guys seem to be in North America. Be happy, you're lucky. You guys have got big volumes. Um, by world standards, your models are really cheap. Um, now, one of the other reasons why things have been not coming out of China in recent times as well as normally is people can't go there for QC. Um, we, we also need to avoid problems from shipping. This is a vacuum former, which I sometimes use just to make accessory parts or that, which is what we're doing here. But we'll use it to make packaging samples. Um, we, we won't use it to make packaging for mass production because it's a manual machine. But I think they're an interesting little machine to have um, because you can also use it to make all sorts of little accessory bits for models. The, um, in this case, the one at, at the back, I've used those to make loads for the uh, ore wagons. I just made those and painted them and then sprinkled dirt over the top. Um, the one at the front is a retaining wall. Uh, anyway, obviously injection molding is not the only way to make models. Um, I have done brass production in the past. It's very labor intensive low tech, uh, whilst it has places for certain things, as a rule of thumb, I don't see it as the future. Um, it might be useful for some things like signs or that where you want them to be very fine, Sign signals, ladders, but it's for the most part, not where we're headed. Um, we, some of the other things can be quite different to produce. You can see here we're making track um, where we're inserting the rails into the base, the, the ties, sleepers, whatever you like to call them. Um, on this, I guess we're somewhere in the middle in terms of world scheme of things. Um, we're not using what's called insert molding, which is what's usually used to make a uh, track that is not flexible track. This is flexible track. Um, insert molding, you basically get the rail, cut it, shape it, or well, shape it, cut it, uh, and put it in the tool, then inject around it. In this case, we've got the base and we've inserted it in, in with the machine, but one at a time manually. And you've got those clamps, they need to be lifted off each time. So it still takes a little bit of time with each one. Um, We've said G scale, they wouldn't do that, uh, but they've got a lot more space to play with. Now, okay, the important bit. What do I think is going to happen in the future? Um, I would say it's a very brave person who predicts the future. So I would not be able to stress enough how much this is a guess. But there are a couple of things I feel reasonably certain we're going to have a continued uncoupling with China. Um, costs have ridden, risen a lot there. It's become near impossible for people who are not citizens of China or Taiwan to go there at, for the moment um, because of their visa restrictions, travel restrictions. Without that, you don't have good QC, factory inspections. Um, it's easier to talk face-to-face, -face, look at things on the spot. Um, in one instance, I went to a factory where we were having trouble with a shade of blue. And we went through about six different versions in one day. And I finally said, yep, yeah, right, that's the one we want, good. If I hadn't been there, I would have had to have um, had samples be sent back and forth. You cannot accurately check colors through a computer screen to a fine level. Um, there's no substitute for being there. I don't want to be too political, but I doubt any of you are members of the Chinese Communist Party, so I can probably get away with saying this. I think the Chinese government is not so much shooting themselves in the foot as taking a bazooka to both of their feet and just going for a big time. Um, I don't know what they're playing. They've gone mad as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, but the result of this, we're probably not going to see prices falling. We've seen a lot of prices rising. You've got inflation across many industries. Models are no different. Um, I think some prices on American products were artificially low levels relative to current conditions for a long time. Um, and some can be held that way because the tooling was old tooling. Um, so that's been paid for. But new products, that won't be true. It's, it's going up. Um, sorry, what else you can do is production moving out. I've seen at the lower end, some things going to Vietnam. In our case, we came back to Taiwan. Um, maybe if someone's really brave, they can go to India. But my understanding is they have less of a cluster. Um, it's an economic theory, fam famous business lecturer called Michael Porter. Uh, uh, his writings on it will probably explain it better than I can here, but based, basically in very short terms that you have a lot of component suppliers, um, skilled workers all in one area that work together and make the whole, rather than just competing, the whole production in that area becomes stronger. In Dongguan, we saw somewhat of a falling apart of that last year and this year, um, where they had a very strong production cluster and then companies started going bankrupt um, when their workers didn't come back or their orders disappeared or whatever. Um, and sometimes that influenced people who were buying from one supplier, but that supplier mostly dealt with other things. However, they did supply some to model producers. Um, Another way to cope with this is what some of the Japanese manufacturers like Kato or that do, where they supply models that are less assembled and people put things on themselves. You get less shipping damage that way too, but the modeler has to do a bit more. Um, I'm not sure how much that'll happen. Um, an extreme case scenario, but whilst for demand in say, Europe, UK, USA, the virus was a, actually a market boom because you had all those people sitting at home. Um, I think you have simple, simple demand and supply might ultimately affect things. We could get a contraction in the entire market size because costs have gone up. We've seen that and maybe some of you guys can understand this better than me. Some of the American suppliers also stopped in the last year or two. You saw companies like Hart and Locomotive Works close altogether. Um, we get very few components from the States, but one obvious one we do is KDs. We've had to wait longer than before. They can't keep up. Um, my understanding of that is partly down to workers. Um, that said, I'm not pessimistic about the hobby on a world scale. Um, our own production volumes have risen. We've seen places in Asia which, other than Japan, really didn't have model trains 20 years ago, um, have really grown a lot. Uh, like the range we've got for Taiwan is massive compared with 20 years ago. That didn't happen without reason. For China, it didn't exist 25 years ago, and now there's quite a lot of models made. Um, mechanization, as I said, is great for labor costs, but has its limits. Um, maybe more hybrid production, where you have some parts that would be very costly to tool, and the volume isn't there if they're small, where some 3D printing may work. Um, the computerized printing that I showed you before, taking over from some tempo printing, etc. We may also need to think about, have we gone too far with details? Is it better to step back a bit, keep costs under control? Um, I'd love to have a crystal ball. I probably wouldn't have to work if I did. I, I would have brought the right chairs 10, 20 years ago. Um, 
that's my guesswork with a little bit of inside information about how things are. But basically, I'm the bearer of bad news, we've still got troubles. Um, that said, the next part, the fun part. I'll just show you a little bit of my own modeling. My own background is not actually from an engineering side, but I'm a modeler who has um, a lot of background in translation that I can flip between English and Chinese without really thinking about it. Uh, I'm a dual citizen of Australia and Taiwan, although I live in Taiwan. Um, I also spent a not insignificant part of time in a uh, amount of time in Australia. Um, the photograph of the layout you see here, it's in my basement, it's partly built. Um, it's ON30. Uh, Australia and Taiwan have a lot of two foot six gauge trains. And that's good because it means we've got the right gauge scale combination with ON30. Um, there's nothing amazing in that modeling. I think if there's anything that I've done right, that is simple is just the lighting, although that's in a basement, strong lighting to make it more like daylight. Um, I have done, I've worked in a number of scales, but uh, G, O, O, N, 30, H, O. Taiwan, I've mostly done H, O because we make H, O models and no one really makes volume production of larger scale models for Taiwan. Um, these are European models of buildings that we've kit bashed into local models. Um, plenty of signs that really indicate where things are. Um, this diorama with the, both the models in the photograph, um, we we produce for someone else. Um, obviously, the, the engine's just an unpainted sample. The cement wagon was something we made before. Um, the backdrop, there is a photo backdrop we make. Um, the tunnel porthole on the rocks, again, a vacuum form products that we make. Um, but it's a simple one. Nothing amazing in there. Um, that's another view of the same thing. The pond in the front, something I, I'm quite happy with. The again vacuum form, but this time of clear plastic, printed piece underneath, so that we could have the fish and the water effect. Um, very light and simple, something I can carry around. I've these engines and the rail car here are brass O gauge models we made. Um, the houses are American kits, laser cut wood kits that I've kit bashed a bit to try and Australianize them a little bit. Um, the car models are die cast Australian cars. You'll notice you guys will probably think the cars are on the wrong side of the road. Um, I can assure you they are on the correct side. Uh, okay. Well, Making models may not be the best way to make money. My wife probably hates that. But a good side of it is I get to mess about with our mistakes. So this engine is a good example of how I could go to town on weathering and not really worry if I messed up. Um, there's no substitute for experience of working on it yourself and having a second go or a third go. Um, Again, this scene is very simple, but I've been able to um, take a model that we make and literally make a mess of it without worrying because it was one that didn't run. Um, this is something I've done that's a little bit more unusual. Uh, it's the old gauge layout in my basement. I've deliberately got a photograph with the road unpainted. Um, what I put in there is a chain drive and magnets under the cars so they can operate. Um, it's not perfect, it's a work in progress, but they're basically dragged around by the magnets um, on the chain 
so that the cars never crash into each other and drive around in a loop. Um, maybe someone's done it before, you know, scale. I haven't seen it if they have. But um, yeah, it's something I've got downstairs in my basement, or I can also say bomb shelter. Um, but um, I'm, I, I realize there's a question there. I'll go to that later. Um, we, these cars are all die cast models made by other people. Um, the layout, it's not huge. It's 380 by 270 centimeters. You can see the boards when they're being put in. Um, it's basically an oval with a lift out section between the two boards at the front. Um, again, on the right, I've got, sorry, I'll skip through one more than I should have. Um, wagons that I've been able to weather, they're our own product. Um, one of the things I'm more happy with on this layout than some of my other modeling is the blending of the backdrop and the grass immediately behind the engine. I think that's something I see with backdrops where people get a nice backdrop and just um, put it down without any blending. It's a good way to make, get a better effect. Uh, I also like to drop away the scenery a little bit just be in front of the backdrop. Um, anyway, again, American kits that I've just deliberately missed up literally um kit bashed a little bit um obviously this layout is not finished that track needs to be painted ballasted it's not even fixed in place in this photograph um nothing amazing with the techniques used there um like i said it's about oh, i've got the non-metric measurements there for you about 12 foot nine by nine foot um this engine here is an engine we made um Someone's asked about the standards. Yeah, they're basically global standards. The coupler height is a standard OM30 HO, it's a 148 or number five KD coupler. So it is actually an American engine. It's a model of a Baldwin engine that was exported to Australia. And I believe the UK had a very similar one. This one is done to 148. The wheel standards, again, are very much like NMRA. Um, so it's fine to put with Bachmann or anything else or in 30. Um, but um, anyway, uh, the, those engines, they were the main engines for the Victorian narrow gauge. Um, this is another diorama, diorama I've made for models of Western Australia. Um, those are not weathered all wagons. But again, you can see I'm taking American kits and kit bashing them. The White House second from the right is fairly heavily kit bashed. It's two, it's two bricks kits put into one building because I thought it looked too small. Um, the shop second from the left is you've got an awning in front with signage that's local on what would be an otherwise built up structure. Um, the, the station at the front, which is largely obscured by the wagons, is a British building, but it's double O, but actually to me it looked fine. If it looks good, I'm okay with it. Um, nothing amazing, but I think perhaps this one is a, a little bit more like your North American modeling. Uh, these are basically EMD locomotives that were modified for Australia, a smaller loading gauge. Um, okay, this one's a little bit more fun. My, my kids love this one. We also make ride on trains. Um, my, my kids like this because I would let them ride that and not worry about it too much. It's, um, it's wildly over-engineered, but it's, 
it was an idea that we had to make, but we never actually commercially produced. Um, I have done some commercial production of ride-on models, but really it's more like home models in that we're making, often making just one. Um, so we get parts laser cut. Um, this engine is not live steam. This engine is, um, it's, it's, I can say it's steam in that it's heated water. Um, but it's battery operated. That train, although it's only five inch gauge, can pull about 30 adults, maybe even 40. Um, it's pulling in that, in this video, it's pulling 30 up a grade on wet track. Um, I can't lift that engine up. In fact, we really need two guys to lift it up. It's the wrong side of 100 kilograms. So what's that? 200 something pounds is how many? Um, I think in weight. Um, really heavy. And the, the tender is also powered, which is what I'm sitting on. Um, having the weight of the driver gives extra adhesion. You can see these are some of the parts. They've just been um, CNC, laser. Um, that's how we did the valve gear for it, for instance. You can see the mechanism in uh, below the dome is how the steam is made. The sound unit is much like a smaller engine sound unit with a bigger speaker. Um, before this whole Wuhan, Mexican bit, virus, whatever you like to call it, COVID thing hit, we had some other business things going where we um, would do things like rent out the ride on trains. It completely killed us. Um, you can see the photo in the left of the Taiwanese Aboriginal guy. It's inside a department store. The one on the right was at a government event um, at a beach area in the south of Taiwan. Um, it used to be good money, albeit hard work, just moving things about. Um, we're lucky that Taiwan has had less than a thousand deaths from the virus. So we, we didn't really, we had no lockdown. We just kept producing, but it still affected us even here in that, say this type of business, what's filmed here. We're doing a run for a department store. It just got completely hit to zero. It went from being maybe once a month or 10 times a year, something like that on average, to zero cases in 19 months. Um, but we've got to keep moving. Um, this, I like to just show a few sort of interesting other bits of where it's crossing the line between um, being the modeler and the job. This model is a 124 scale model of a wagon that we made for people who make real trains. Uh, it cost a fortune because they were very demanding. And when you make a one-off model to very precise standards, it's a lot of work. Um, uh, this one here, it's a restaurant where it's an all you can eat deal. Um, we're using American G-scale trains and we set it up for the restaurant. Those guys don't know anything about trains. They tend to sort of come to us and say, oh, I want one of those good looking engines. And sort of say, well, what do you mean? And after five minutes talking, you figure out they mean a steam engine or a diesel or something like that. Um, but they want us to come in, set it up, and it's all got to work very reliably. So we do things like add a lot of wires so that if one gets damaged, we've still got um, stable power to the track. We don't need any DCC, anything like that. Very simple in some respects, but it's got to be able to operate seven days a week, eight hours a day, uh, pulling a heavy load, which is why we've got two USA trains engines on the front and all those little plates. The restaurants, they like it because obviously it cuts down on workers. Less obviously, it um, meant that the food constantly coming 
their turnaround they found was faster. People would, but people are paying the same price. It's a fixed price where you can eat. If they get out of the restaurant, it's another seat they can use. They also end up eating less because they eat fast, they get full. If you just sit there for three hours or four hours, then you'll end up eating more. Um, we don't really have much G scale in Taiwan. It's a very crowded little country. People have small houses or apartments. Um, anyway, that's the end. Uh, to answer the question from Edward, how much for the hand car? We haven't actually sold them because our cost was ridiculous. I really need to redesign it and build a cheaper one. It's, it's way too heavy. Um, but I just thought it was something interesting. Um, if anyone else has got any other questions, go for it. Green, what do you uh, what do you see China doing in the next year, eighteen months? Is it going to get worse over there as far as production is concerned? I think it, it's going to be much the same because China is going to start stay largely closed. Now it may feel worse in that. People were basically running down inventory. So things are going to appear more out of stock um, than they were, or at least the same. Yes, production has somewhat restarted, um, but you still have problems with travel being exceedingly difficult. That is not going to be good for quality control. Um, like I said, their government is... Uh, how can I say it politely? Interesting. I don't know what they're trying to do. Um, they've drunk their own Kool-Aid. They've started to believe their own talk too much. So they're being fairly aggressive to other countries. Um, that. What about, what about where you are in Taiwan with all of the uh, flybys and so forth that we hear about over here? I mean, life goes on. We, I mean. We are, for all effective purposes, a completely different country, completely different government. Um, my personal 30-second take on it is they won't do anything for a short term. They've got the Olympics next year, Winter yeah. Olympics. Um, yeah. our, we, on the other hand, have relatively stable production. Um, once this finishes, I'm going to get in my car and drive to the other end of the country to visit a supplier of uh, the etching plates. We've, we haven't had any production stock. And bizarrely, um, because the virus has been so well handled here, it's created an economic boom um, because people are pushing production towards Taiwan. Um, because we have a stable economic base, things are operating about as normally as any country in the world. So for us, that's, that's a good thing. We're seeing, I mean, when you're an exporter, it's a negative. The Taiwan currency, the NT is rising relative to other currencies, which hurts our costs, but our costs haven't exploded maybe as much as in some other things shipping costs have gone completely mad and also yeah. gotten slower. Um, so that's also affecting supply. Um, my guess is this isn't over. But you tell me when the variants of the variants of the variants will stop. Um, what, is the, what is the view from, from where you are? Why, why are the shipping costs, uh, why have they gone crazy? and, and why can't we get uh, why can't we get the containers from point A to point B? Okay, uh, two things. First, air freight. Um, you don't have airplanes flying as much. It used to be a lot of cargo went in the cargo hold of a passenger plane. There just aren't as many passenger planes flying across the world because people can't travel. So, uh, and planes there just weren't enough cargo planes set up um to take up uh, the the uh, space that had disappeared from passenger plane cargo holds 
Now for containers, remember you've got many countries that have had restrictions on people entering. Um, so it's become very difficult for people to operate shipping um, because of all these restrictions on people who are non-citizens entering another country or if they do, they have to go to quarantine. Um, I don't China. understand. What, what does that have to do with getting a container from point A to point B? People have got to work those ships. So you're, you're talking about the crews getting access? Yes. Or the, or the container, or the boats not even being allowed into ports in some cases. Gotcha. Because gotcha. they're worried that, that the crews have the virus. Um, so that affects it. Gotcha. Um, then um, all of that's affecting us. I, to be honest, I feel like I, I know less about that part, the, obviously the production side of the models, but it's another effect. Yeah. It's, it's just another, it's just another block, you know, in the chain or something like that, that it's affecting us. Uh, you tell me when that stops. Um, we personally tend to use a mix of surface and air freight. Um, now, air can really be an issue for samples, for instance. So that's really, especially when people can't travel, that's really supplying, slowing down development. Now, thankfully, we can send images across the world instantly. But like I said before, you cannot check a color perfectly that way. And again, yeah. there's no substitute for seeing the actual product for being able to take it out and run it. Uh, you know, I've sent videos to customers before of a model running, which was actually quite very quiet. And they, and they saw the video and said, oh, it looks great, but that mechanism is terrible. It's so noisy. Um, I was like, well, no, it's not. You've turned the volume up too much or uh, things like that. So that's why I say sometimes there is no substitute for the actual thing. Um, that's why life has been a bit difficult. So I, I'm not sure that model production can move back to America easily or that for you guys, because you don't have that um, cluster of producers yeah. active um, that perhaps you had in the 1950s or 60s. Uh, what about Korea? not important um the only thing they really make much is brass um their labor costs are even higher than ours yeah their japan and taiwan make more models than korea if it's not brass models. Mm. um the the koreans when you still i realized they were quite important in brass production maybe to a certain extent still are but I'm aware of some of the Korean factories in China used to do, say, a lot of parts, send them back to Korea for the final bits. Um, yeah. Say with brass models, ideally you would use silkscreen printed um, decals, if you're going to use decals. That's the best type of decal. You don't want one that's just been made, at a, made on a computer printer. Like that. It's not as good. But I've only ever seen one factory in China doing their own silkscreen decals. It was run by a Korean. It was the factory that makes KM1's models for Germany. Um, and there was a cluster of Koreans in Qingdao. But as I'm not aware of the situation in Wollongong, but I know some of them. And some of them basically stopped operating because the Koreans couldn't go back and forth because yeah. of um, if they were not citizens of China, yeah. they were not allowed to enter China. Yeah. Um, I have the bizarre status of being allowed to enter China because I'm a citizen of Taiwan and they think that they own us. Um, but I'm a white guy, so I'm one of the small percentage of Taiwanese citizens who's well, there's about 5% who are not um, of Chinese origin. Um, so when I go to, I used to go to China fairly often. And they, the customs guys usually at the border would just look at sort of sheer disbelief and it's like how did you have a Taiwan 
uh, <laughs> ID card uh, because they'd been they'd heard the propaganda too much. Thought that a hundred percent of Taiwanese were ethnic or Chinese. It's not true. Um, Dutch came here in the 1700s and this um, immigration and so on. Uh, but anyway, even I theoretically could go. I haven't gone. One, because I feel the government has gone mad. And second, because I have to do three weeks quarantine when I go over there and two weeks when I come back. And yeah. everything's so backed up anyway that we just tried to do things ourselves here. We started to move our production here about six years ago. And at the time, everyone thought I was a lunatic. Maybe they were correct. Um, certainly, it seemed that way for a while. But for all the last two years or so, it suddenly started to seem like a good move because we were able to continue producing. And people are accepting higher costs if you are reliable. Yeah. And right now, a lot of people, they might be, they might even be good people, but you cannot be reliable if you can't get your component parts. Um, there's a famous economics essay, you can't make a pencil because a pencil is a fairly simple product. Um, basically saying the gist of it is you need um, suppliers. You can't do everything yourself. Um, you, you, need um, to be able to get paint. You need to be able to, say you're making a brass model, you need to be able to get the brass. You need to be able to get the, the materials to make lost wax castings or whatever other form of casting you're using. Um, that is, um, how can I say, not, um what it was so it's not necessarily always the fault of the supplier that cannot supply they don't want to not be doing business um they that is not an ideal situation um for any supplier they they want to make money like everyone else yeah um, they want to have a job but yeah. Yeah. the fact is it's because of those travel restrictions, because of the other things. Um, yeah, someone's just said um, Vietnam is next. I personally have wondered about the Philippines. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about that. But it, it would take someone with the experience to go there and spend a lot of time there. The Philippines, they speak English more. Um, it's a low wage country. They're, they're, it's a fairly poor country. And it doesn't seem to want to change. It was the second richest country in Asia at the end of World War II. Now it's poorer than Indonesia. Mm -hmm. they, they have a very high birth rate, the Catholics. Um, and whereas, say, countries like China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, especially Japan, Korea, Taiwan, we have incredibly low birth rates. Um, in Taiwan's case, it's, and I think a little bit South Korea, immigration is taking up a little bit of the slack, but, um, but I think brass though is also being outdone by newer techniques. That plastic injection got better. Um, and in real terms, it got cheaper than it was, whereas brass has remained labor intensive. Um, so, Vietnam, I, I can remember 20 something years ago, people in Taiwan talking about Vietnam possibly yes. as another uh, Oh okay. yeah, uh, uh, look, uh, and, and that's I, still true. And My brother-in-law went to Vietnam two days ago um, because they've got a factory there. It's nothing to do with models, but it's just a good example. And yeah. he, he's, he put a photograph up on Facebook and it looked like he'd hired a plane. Um, it yeah. was ridiculous. He said there were less than 10 people on this huge plane. Um, yeah. But that is, is, okay, how things are still difficult. Yes, Vietnam, they've got it together a little bit more about economics. Their government seems a bit less crazy than China's one at the moment. 
um, but they don't have the level of experience. Um, you have a bit more of a language barrier for teaching there. In, in China, the cluster developed next to Hong Kong in Dongguan. Yeah. Because yeah. you had experienced people from Hong Kong going Hong across Kong. the border easily. Yeah. And they had a shared language of Cantonese. Yeah. Um, which is why it really started in, in Guangdong province next to Hong Kong. Um, or at least that's my take on it. Um, and later people did try and do production elsewhere. And that's happened a bit in China, within China, I mean, production within China. Um, but you've, even though you've got a few clusters around Changzhou, Shanghai, uh, et cetera, we've never really seen a cluster of anything like what we saw in Dongguan elsewhere. In fact, at one point, I think that one city that yeah. lots of people have never heard of was accounting for more than half the world's production of models. Companies like Keita Bachmann or Sandagen, um, sometimes called Santa Khan, uh, that used to do a lot of production for other companies. At one point, it was the biggest model train producer in the world. Well, all in Shenzhen Dongguan. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, bottom line, I think things will continue to come out not as quickly. Um, we may do maybe need to think a little bit more laterally about producing either simpler to assemble models to keep costs under control. That's something I want to do for some things that I want to release next year to, to make it not to make it deliberately easy to make. I don't want to price ourselves out of the market on everything. That said, I realize some people want um, certain products that are difficult to make inherently. Right now I'm making an OM30 coach for well developing i should say an om30 coach for australia that is a fairly complex model and we have a a small but very defined market for that and those guys will pay the money if we if we make a big model so a, a good model um because they want that detail and australia is a rich country they'll they'll pay for it um but to i think if we can produce some simple, reliable, accessible models that people can then add bits to themselves if they want at a good price, that's a way to go. Um, that we do it in a way that allows for simple assembly. Maybe it's not perfect accuracy, um, but where our machinery with the automated glue machine dispenser, whatever I should call it that I showed you before, yeah. um, can take up a lot of the stack with the gluing and it can almost fall together in terms of the pieces going into mounting points and so on. That's something we maybe need to think about a little bit more. So mod, I think it's natural that people like to be able to buy nicely detailed, ready to run product, but maybe if people want to keep things cheap, models will have to be modelers literally a bit more. Um, that, um, and that may not be bad. No, uh, uh, it's you know I I think having the simple entry things is important. Um, in time, I re and this is really a very long term thought, which we'll see if we get there. I'd like to do a, a cheaper OM thirty set um, because I look at the prices of some of the other things and feel that it's pricing potential new modelers out of entering the hobby because they look at it and say 300 and something dollars for a set. Ooh, um, they won't go there on the first purchase. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't continue to produce detailed specific models for demanding markets, but that, um, how can I do this politely? Uh, a certain large American dominant market dominant brand, beginning with B, their prices have gone up so much on some things, and where they haven't, it was just old stock. That I feel it's running a company by an accountant. Um, it's not looking at the price elasticity enough. Um, the yeah. costs have, have risen too much. Yes, they're making a lot of sets, 
thought, wow, they're really expensive compared um, with what they were. Now, someone said, bring back the Athern Blue Box. Why? I think it sounds great in theory. I'm not entirely sure on, on two points. One is, in some cases, um, for some parts where it used to be more difficult for them to glue, our machines can take up the slack. Um, there are certain bits that we can assemble um, far more efficiently than modelers. If we have jigs and that, um, that allow for easy assembly, you can't necessarily do that at home. You can't make a jig with just one piece um, or buy the arbor press or something. Like, a, okay, I'll, uh, an example wheels. Yes, we could make a kit, but we would make the wheels and axles assembled together because you cannot put that together easily at home. You, if you did actually manage to push the wheel onto the axle, you would almost certainly not have it in with the degree of alignment that we can get from the jig and the automated arbor press. Um, yeah. So there's a reason why we need, now once upon a time, people might've used a plastic wheel. We've moved on, metal wheels are better, but it's being able to do it with those automated parts and assembly, the semi-automated assembly, that we've been able to do that at a reasonable cost in the world. So I, I don't think there's a single answer. Um, we did try offering some of the wagons, like say the yellow ore wagon as a kit, mm -hmm. and we found that the take up was remarkably low. It was less mm -hmm. than 10% of our right. sales of the assembled ones. Karen, can, um, can I ask a question on that same, sure. that same uh, vein? Someone asked the question about undecorated kits. And I was thinking about what's the ratio in your experience when you have an undecorated model versus the decorated models and what the demand is. Less than 10%. Yeah, that, 10%. that was my, it's like manual transmissions in cars now. Um, yeah. You know, it's the same thing. Nobody wants to buy, people like to buy things they can dig out of the box and put on the track and, and run. The vast majority of people, it seems like. Yeah, okay, the Athern guy, I can understand why. He does that. Um, we've offered it on some product because where we think the assembly can be simple or decoration simple because we can. But my take up has been less than 10% of our sales. So it's still, I mean, it's still a small part. It doesn't seem to be the be all end all solution. Um, maybe making a simpler product with some bits that people that are perhaps easy to fit bits where, it, because I think some decoration is difficult. Um, I would class myself as at least, a, I would hope at least a, a medium level modeler. And there are some kits that I can find quite difficult mm. to, to finish off perfectly um, with decoration that's complex or that if you've got complex lining or something like that. It's very time consuming. So um, the point being, there isn't a, a, a simple one uh, answer fits all case scenarios solution. Um, am I, the question, okay, for Kieran, are you looking at doing something similar to Fleischmann Magic Train? No, I would not do what Fleischmann Magic Train did because they do those bizarre bright colors and that. I would rather I would rather do, yes, we would do a more basic version, but we will try and keep the colors more realistic. Um, the, the to us, yes, we could take off, we could add less parts. Um, that's certainly a solution. In Taiwan in the past, we offer, we offered two levels of our Taiwan models. One being the train set version, which had um, dumbed down parts. For instance, no DCC plug, no flywheel, a light, only one light per engine at the front. Um, Bachmann couplers, not KD couplers, but Bachmann ones were still cheaper. Um, less printing, et cetera, et cetera. And the price was about half. We actually made less 
markup um, on them, but we considered the molds uh, really amateurized from the detailed ones and looked at it as a way to try and bring people in. And that did work to a certain extent by our warranty cards estimation, about 10% of people who brought a train set then subsequently brought other items. Mm. It's not a perfect way to um, measure it, but it's the best we can. Um, and my guess just from meeting customers twice in that was about 10% of people who buy a train set then become uh, more interested in the hobby longer beyond that train set seems to be reasonable but i think we've got to go back to being able to have those available and visible um i realize that i, I often get asked like others you know why aren't there these cheap train sets in toy shops and that i look at my own kids and i i have kids who are like one's kindergarten one's elementary school age um and I realized they do still like physical things. My son loves Lego. He, he, um, they don't just want computer games. But that said, there's more competition out there for their attention than there once was. There were no computer games for a lot of you guys when you were kids. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no telephones that had a computer in them. Um, the, there wasn't a an instant video streaming package in, in a pocket. Um, so we still have to keep working to get their attention. Um, but I think people like physical things, not just virtual ones, still. Like I see that he wants to play with my trains. Um, uh, that I find reassuring. That hand car that I showed him on earlier, both he and my daughter love it. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's real. They can touch it. Um, that sort of thing, I think, is important. Um, that's our way forward, or at least yeah. that's how that's my personal take on. It. Well, obviously, everyone's got their own ideas, and like I said, there's no one simple answer. I don't think the world's ending, but at the same time, we're not going to have an easy time. Kareem, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us this evening and to share your ideas and your, your knowledge. It's, uh, it's, thank been you, it's really been fascinating. Uh, and you're welcome back anytime. I'll, I'll get back in touch with you. Yeah.